Hi, this is Dr. Ben Finio. I teach mechatronics at Cornell University, and I also design electronics and robotics projects for K-12 students. In this video, I'll be going through some of the most common mistakes I see students of all ages make when working with circuits, particularly when building circuits on a breadboard, using a multimeter, and when analyzing circuits. Let's start with the breadboard because this is something even college-age students can have trouble with if they've never used one before. As an example, we'll use this simple circuit with a battery pack, three LEDs wired in parallel, and three current limiting resistors. If you want to learn more about LEDs and current limiting resistors, I have a separate video about that linked in the description. Mistake number one, and probably the most common mistake I see overall, is simply having a breadboard part in the wrong row. This is easy to do because the holes are so tiny and they're easy to get mixed up. It can happen to everyone. I still make this mistake. You could be staring at a circuit for 10-15 minutes, swearing you have everything wired correctly, and then finally you realize you just have one wire in the wrong place and that's enough to stop the entire circuit from working. For example here, it looks like my middle yellow LED has gone out. I might think I've burned out the LED or something else is wrong. But if I zoom in and look really closely, zoomed in a little too far there, I can see that one leg of my LED is actually not in the same row as this jumper wire. So if you know about breadboards, and again, I have a separate video about those, you know that the holes are electrically connected through each half row. So there's a gap in the middle. They're not connected across the gap, but these five holes here are all connected to each other. The adjacent rows are not connected to each other. So there's no electrical connection between this leg of the LED and this jumper wire here, in order to light that LED up again, I need to move that leg back up to that row. And now I have a complete circuit and the LED lights up. And again, the more parts you have in a circuit, just the more chance there is for error here. I could have had a resistor in a wrong row, one of the jumper wires in the wrong row, etc. So if a student calls you over and says, it's not working, I swear I checked the diagram, or if you have content online and somebody emails you or submits a support ticket and says, you know, we checked the diagram three times, we swear it's right. Nine times out of 10, if you double check their wiring, you'll actually find something misplaced somewhere and that will prevent the circuit from working. So it's kind of like proofreading your own writing. There are typos you'll just miss. It always helps to have a second set of eyes, if possible, to double check your circuit and look for errors like that. Mistake number two is having a part in the breadboard backwards. And again, this is very common with LEDs or parts that might, might look symmetric, but actually have a polarity to them and need to be connected in a certain way. So again, I have my three LEDs here. The green one is out. If I look closely, I'll see that this time it is in all the correct rows, so that's probably not my problem. But if I pull it out, I'll notice that the longer leg is on the negative side. That is supposed to be on the positive side in the case of an LED. So if I pop that back in, my LED lights up and I'm okay. Now, this doesn't apply to all parts. For example, the jumper wires are symmetric. <clears throat> Excuse me, and you'll see I can take this resistor out and flip it around. The resistor is symmetric. So some parts are symmetric and the orientation doesn't matter. Some parts are not. So the LEDs are one example. There are other parts, for example, like transistors that have three legs that again are not, not symmetric. You have to be careful and kind of look at the shape of the packaging to make sure you get their orientation correct in the breadboard. The same goes for integrated circuits. For example, here's a 555 timer. It's a very popular part. And if you look carefully, there is a little notch on one end of this rectangular package. So you have to make sure you have that notch in the correct orientation when building the circuit. If you get this flipped upside down, all the pins will be corrected wrong, connected wrong and your circuit won't work. Number three not pushing components into the breadboard all the way. This is something I've found to be more of a problem with younger students, especially if you are using these pre-cut jumper wire kits. So if we zoom in here, you'll see that all of my jumper wires are pressed pretty much flush with the breadboard. So if I pull those out, you'll see that there's actually a pretty decent length of wire that is plugged into the board. And what you'll see younger students do sometimes is just kind of just barely get the metal to make contact there, but not really push it in all the way. And then you'll have an intermittent electric contact and you'll see that my yellow LED isn't really lighting up there until I get that in there firmly. There we go. Now the LED lights up. So again, that is especially true if you are using these tiny pre-cut wires and the students are trying to force them to a certain distance. Say if I wanted to use this yellow one to just barely bridge that gap, 
and you see it's a little too long to do that. So what students will do is kind of bend these inward and try to force it in like this. And then you won't get the full length of contact. They'll kind of just wind up kinking these and pressing the plastic down flat, but not necessarily actually getting the metal in all the way. So if you are using the pre-cut wires, a better way to do that, if you want a wire to be flush against the breadboard and kind of span a certain length, is actually to bend it straight first and then bend it into a U shape. And that will give you kind of a better ability to get the metal all the way in there. And then if you want it flat, you can bend the wire sideways a little bit. So again, look out for this when working with younger students because you're not going to have a good electrical contact there. Mistake number four is just having a messy breadboard in general. So it is possible to wire something correctly electrically, but just have it be sort of a mess. For example, Look at the circuits on the left and right here. Electrically, these are equivalent. They're both just three LEDs wired in parallel, but notice how the circuit on the left is much neater. I have trimmed the leads of the resistors and cut shorter jumper wires so they're flush with the surface of the breadboard, and I've physically arranged the LEDs so they're in parallel, whereas this one on the right here, I kind of intentionally did a bad job just using wires that are way longer than necessary. They're not color-coded. I didn't cut the resistor leads, which is always risky when you have long parts with uninsulated leads sticking up like this. It's easy for them to bump into each other and cause short circuits. And I didn't really have a master plan to how I built this. I just kind of tossed all three LEDs in there. So again, electrically, this circuit is equivalent and it's working just fine. But as you start building more and more complicated circuits, this gets much more difficult to debug. So things like using short wires so you can actually trace them color coding your wires. And again, that's something you have to watch out for with these, here it is, pre-cut jumper wire kits is they come with nice, neat wires of different lengths, but not necessarily in the colors you want. So if you wanna use red for power and black for ground, then sometimes it's better to have spools of jumper wire and a pair of wire cutters so you can cut and form your own wires of every color at the right length that you need. So again, this is something students of all ages are guilty of, including students in my college class. They'll ask a TA or somebody to come help them troubleshoot and you see a circuit like this and it's just kind of like, whoa, it's kind of hard for me to help you there because your wiring is so messy that it's hard to trace things or find where the errors are. So it's a good habit to do this. Again, when you're building more complicated circuit, it, just like if you were building something physically to Sketch it out beforehand, have a plan for where things are going to go. Don't just start throwing parts in one at a time and then, you know, you'll run out of room or not have things line up nicely. So easy for a simple circuit like this with three LEDs in parallel. Again, more complicated when you're starting to use integrated circuits like 555 timers or op amps or something. But you want to have a master plan for how things are going to look on the breadboard at the end so it is neat and easy to debug. Mistake number five, and this ties in closely to the previous point, not making use of the breadboard power rails. So students might either not understand how to use these or just kind of forget that they exist. But on the left breadboard here, you can see I've made use of the power rails. So these are columns that are connected the whole way up and down the breadboard. So in general, the idea is that for a battery powered circuit, I have my battery here. I have the red wire feeding into one of these and the black wire feeding into another. That gives me easy access to power and ground the whole way up and down my circuit. So in this case, my resistors just need to go right from the row with the LED over to the power bus. Then I have them both connected to the other side. I have these jumper wires just go right to the ground bus. I don't have to run long wires to connect to power and ground everywhere. If you forget to use those, like I have here, I just have my power going into one row of the breadboard, and then I kind of have to have all my resistors clustered in going to that row. Same thing on the other side. I just have my ground going into one row. I didn't use the bus. Then I need multiple longer jumper wires going to that row. So especially, again, for bigger circuits with a lot of power and ground connections, that's just going to make things messy and require more or longer wires. So you always, 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 first thing you want to do is make sure you plan to use these power and ground buses, and then that will allow you to keep your circuit neater with tighter wiring, which again is kind of a subset of the previous point. Let's move on to the multimeter. Now, this isn't really an introductory multimeter tutorial. There are plenty of other videos on YouTube that will introduce you to using a multimeter. Again, this is kind of assuming you know what a multimeter is and going over some common mistakes students will make with one. 
First is having the probes plugged into the wrong ports. So most multimeters, at least the vast majority that I've seen, have three ports. There's a COM port, so that's where your black or ground probe is going to go. That one never really changes. But then you need to move the red one depending on what you are measuring. So in this case, I have one port labeled V omega milliamps. That means I'm going to use this port for volts, ohms or measuring resistance, and currents in the milliamp range. And you can see there will usually be a fuse, in this case, maximum of 500 milliamps for that port. So if I want to measure more than 500 milliamps, I need to move this plug over to a 10 amp port, which can measure a much higher current. So we're not even worrying about the dial setting yet. But again, what you'll see students do is pick up a multimeter, for example, a shared one in a lab that previously somebody had used to measure a high current and then they didn't put the port back here. The next student won't check. They will set the dial to measure voltage or resistance and then wonder why it's not working. And it's because this probe is in the wrong port. So always remember, make sure this probe is in the correct port for what you are measuring. The other thing you'll see is students don't check how much current they're expecting to measure. They might accidentally measure a short circuit, or they might measure a motor or something that draws a lot of current and blow out this fuse on the smaller port. So if you are measuring current, the rule of thumb is that you should generally start in the higher range. Make sure that you are measuring a safe amount of current, and if it's low enough, you can move it down to the lower range. But if you accidentally measure a current that's too high with this port, you're just going to blow the fuse out. So again, haven't gotten to the dial settings, we'll talk about that next, but you want to make sure the probes are in the right ports for what you want to measure. So the next mistake you will see is the wrong multimeter dial setting, usually for manual ranging multimeters without properly setting the range. So for example, say I have my battery pack connected to my circuit here, I want to measure the voltage of my power buses, I have my multimeter on, I have the probe in the correct port for voltage, but I have it set to the 2000 millivolt range on the dial here. And when I go ahead and stick these probes into my buses, multimeter screen just reads one. So what does that mean? Other screens might say OL for overload or some other sort of error message that doesn't seem like a correct reading. And that's because I have this range set too low. I have four AA batteries in series here. So I would expect this to provide about 6 volts, or 6,000 millivolts. So this number indicates the maximum value you can read for that range. So in order to get a reading here, I would need to turn it up to at least 20 volts. And again, now when I do that, you can see these batteries are partially dead, so I'm getting about 5.5 volts or so. But again, if you have a range that is too low, you won't get a reading at all. You can still get a, a reading with a higher range. For example, if I move up to... 200 volts, I will still get a reading, but with less accuracy, not as many decimal places. And of course, this is assuming I have the right units selected. If I'm over here in the ohms range or in the current range, I'm either not going to get a reading at all, or if I'm set to measure current, I'm potentially going to break something. This is another thing to be careful about. Remember, if you set this to measure current, and you're on the lower current port, and then you measure a battery directly, you're sending a short circuit directly through your multimeter, so you're potentially gonna blow that fuse. So again, there's two different things to look out for there. There's both the physical port the probe is plugged into, and then the dial setting. You need to check that students have both of them set correctly for what they're trying to measure. Mistake number eight, connecting the multimeter probes wrong. So again, this isn't an introductory multimeter tutorial. But in general, the rule is if you want to measure the voltage of something, you need to connect your probes in parallel. If you want to measure the current through something, you need to connect the probes in series. So I've switched to a different multimeter here where I have some little adapters that allow me to put jumper wires into the breadboard easily. So for voltage, this is generally easier. I'll zoom in here. For example, if I want to measure the voltage across an LED, I just need to put one of these wires on each end of the LED. And if I zoom back out, I'll see that I have a voltage drop of about two volts across that LED. Again, you might have to be careful and look out for misunderstandings about how things are electrically connected in a breadboard versus how they look physically. For example, if I put my probes in like this, I might think, okay, that's in parallel. It's physically right next to each end of the LED, but electrically those rows aren't connected. So if I zoom back out, you see I'm getting a reading of zero. 
But again, in general, for voltage, this isn't as difficult or something students have as much trouble with. For example, if I want to measure the voltage across that resistor, I do the same thing. I put one probe on each end of the resistor, and we get the voltage drop of about 3.42 volts across the resistor. Students have a lot more trouble measuring things in series, though, because in order to do that, you need to physically break your circuit and rearrange it on the breadboard. So what I will see students do if I ask them to measure the current through one of these LEDs is they'll set the multimeter to measure current. I can assume that the current through an LED is going to be pretty low because of the current limiting resistors I have selected, so I'm going to leave my probe in the lower current port. What students will then do is come into the breadboard and put the probes here and here. And go, okay, that's in series with the LED because it's all on a line. Why am I getting zero current? The LED is still on, so I know there still has to be current flowing through it. But if you look at how this is wired, again, thinking about how the breadboard is wired, your multimeter probes are physically connected to the same point, sorry, electrically connected to the same point in the circuit here. You didn't break the path and force current to throw through, flow through the multimeter. All you've done is short circuit your two multimeter probes. So in order to actually measure the current through the LED, what I need to do is put my probes in different rows and also move the leg of the LED to a different row. So you see I've temporarily disconnected the LED. It turns off. I move it there, the LED is on. Now if I trace the path of the current, it's coming through this resistor. Point with a pencil here so you can see a little better. Now the current's coming through the resistor, through this wire, off through my multimeter, back through this wire and through the LED. Whereas before, the current here is just coming straight, th straight through and flowing through the LED. There's no reason for it to need to throw, flow through the multimeter. So if I move that back and zoom out again, we will see that now I'm properly measuring the current through that LED of about 15 milliamps. Now let's switch to analyzing circuits. So this is something you usually won't see until high school or college when students are taking a physics class or an electrical engineering intro to circuits course. And there are a lot of misconceptions around how open circuits work. So mistake number nine, misunderstanding open circuits. Let's look at a simple circuit with just a battery, a resistor, and a switch in series. Now, if you show students this circuit with the switch closed and ask them what the voltage is right there, most of them will correctly say that it's zero volts. Again, for a battery, with this sign convention, usually in a battery-powered circuit, we define the negative terminal as ground, so I don't have the drown ground signal drawn explicitly here, but that would be zero volts. This will be three volts. Again, I have a separate video about what exactly ground means in a circuit. I'm not going to cover that in this video, but you will then have current flowing through this resistor. All of the voltage will drop over the resistor, and the voltage on the other side of that resistor will be zero volts. You're assuming this is an ideal switch. It has no resistance. So there's no voltage drop across the switch. The voltage there is zero. Great, that's easy. That might seem trivial if you've done any basic circuit analysis or Ohm's law. What is a lot more confusing is if you show students this version of the circuit with the switch open, if you ask everybody what the voltage here is, again, they'll get that correct. They'll say zero volts. If you ask them what the voltage here is, Many students will also say zero volts, and that is wrong. Okay, it is incorrect. The voltage there is not zero volts, it is three volts. And this is very confusing and counterintuitive to a lot of people, but if you just work it out using Ohm's law, you can show that it makes sense. Okay, so we have an open circuit, an open switch here. We know that that means no current can be flowing. Okay, the current through this circuit has to be zero. Okay, that means the current through this resistor is zero. I equals zero. And what is Ohm's law? V equals IR. So you'll notice that I didn't give a value for that resistor. I don't care if it's one ohm, 100 ohms, a mega ohm, doesn't matter. The current through that resistor is zero. Zero times anything is still zero. Okay, so the voltage drop across that resistor is zero times something 
the voltage drop across that resistor is zero. So if I know that the voltage here is three volts because of my battery pack, the voltage drop across this resistor has to be zero because there is no current through that resistor, then the voltage here is still three volts. Again, very simple, just showing the math with Ohm's law, but very counterintuitive. If you show people this circuit, most of them will say the voltage there is zero. I did this in a college level class. Nobody believed me at first. You know, I had to work through the derivation with Ohm's law to show that the voltage there is still three volts. So again, really simple when the switch is closed, not so intuitive when the switch is open. This matters for things like pull up and pull down resistors and more advanced circuits where you have switches opening and closing. But this is kind of the simplest example you can do to demonstrate that when the current through a resistor is zero, the voltage drop across that resistor is zero. And that comes up a lot in more advanced circuits. My 10th and final misconception, and this one really probably only applies to college level electrical engineering classes, is blindly applying Ohm's law when you shouldn't. So students who have taken a high school physics class or an intro college level E&M class get really, really used to analyzing resistor networks and using Ohm's law. And when you start throwing new components at them like operational amplifiers or MOSFETs or things that have pins that do not draw any current. So by definition, in the ideal case for an ideal op amp, these two input pins don't draw any current. For an ideal MOSFET, this gate pin doesn't draw any current. So again, we know that the current into those point points is always zero. So it's kind of like the open switch case in the previous example. We know that the current through those is always zero. So again, the voltage drop over this resistor is always gonna be zero. So in this case, if I have five volts in, I'll still have five volts on that input. Same thing for the MOSFET, no current through this resistor. If I have five volts there, I'm gonna have five volts here. But if you ask students, what happens if I increase the value of this resistor? Again, I didn't give a value here, but say, say it was 100 ohms, and I say, what happens to the current if I increase this resistor to 200 ohms? Their instinct will be, okay, Ohm's law, if my voltage is the same and my resistance goes up, then my current has to go down. But in this case, that's not true. My current is just still zero. This current is always zero because by definition for the operation of this device, that input pin does not draw any current. Same thing for the MOSFET. So again, their intuition, just because they've seen it over and over and over again and used it so much in physics, is just to apply Ohm's law, but it's kind of a trick question. This current is always zero, and it doesn't depend on the value of that resistor. If I increase the resistor, the current is still zero. If I decrease the resistance, the current is still zero. It doesn't matter. So hopefully you found that useful, whether you're a student or a teacher. If you have a question or an idea for another video, please leave a comment, and I'll try to get back to you. Thanks.